Hello, welcome to our Unit 1 and Unit 2 review of pre-calculus. Um, in this topic, we cover functions, and we also talk, talk about powers, rationals, and polynomials. Okay, so our first question is, how do you test for symmetry? And um, this is simple enough. If you have a calculator, obviously plug it in and check where your symmetry is. If you don't have a calculator, this is pretty simple as well. For the symmetry test, all you're doing Sorry, I'm trying to adjust my pen here. All you're doing is changing one of them to one of your variables to a negative. So if you're testing the x-axis, then you're going to change your y to negative y. If you're testing the y-axis, you're going to change your x to negative oops, x. And if you're testing your origin, then you're going to test both of them. Because, I mean, obviously you can think about what's happening with symmetry and why these are becoming negative. Because uh, if you're testing the x-axis, well, then all of your y values up top have to become the same y values on bottom. They just have to be negative. They just have to be reflected or change that sign. Okay. Um, what are the three standard types of symmetry? We just talked about it. But how, how do we say that? We say the phrase uh, with respect to... and whatever it is, the x-axis, the y-axis, and the origin. There is a fourth type, I mean, there's multiple types of symmetry, but there's a fourth type of symmetry that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides, and that's symmetry with specifically the line y equals x, and that is our um, inverses, so that's the formal definition of an inverse, is that it has symmetry with the line y equals x. Okay, and what kind of symmetry is not a function? Well, if we think about that graphically, any function um, that has symmetry over the y-axis, any, any, sorry, any graph that has symmetry over the y-axis, well, is that going to pass the vertical line test? More than likely, it's going to pass the vertical line test. What about with the origin? Again, if I'm just moving this quadrant over here and this quadrant over here, probably going to pass that vertical line test. But the one that we can always guarantee will not pass the vertical line test is whatever I have, if I reflect it over the x-axis, the moment I start drawing those vertical lines, you're hitting that same reflection, which means that the x-axis uh, or x-axis symmetry is guaranteed to not be a function. And that leads us into our next topic, which we're talking about even odd functions. So first of all, how do you test for even odd functions? Again, we're just changing the sign, except for this one, you're going to test all functions by simply changing the function of x. Of, sorry, changing the sign of x. If you return back the original function, this is what we call even. If you return back the negative function, every sign in the function has been changed. This is what we call either. If you get something funky, then we say it is neither even nor odd. Um, another thing, another definition, a definition for even odd, because if you have a calculator, there's an easier way to see whether something is even and odd. This means that you have symmetry with the uh, y-axis. This means you have symmetry with the origin. And if it's neither, it's either something funky or it's symmetry with the x-axis. Because remember, neither uh, uh, x-axis symmetry is not a function. So that would be why if you're testing if something is even or odd function, neither means it's not a function. Okay. Uh, don't know what that did. So what does it mean if you have neither as your answer? Well, I just went into that, but it really means that um, either you don't have a function or you have some sort of funky function happening, um, but it's very possible your function can no longer pass that vertical line test. Okay. Here we have what's called a function operator. I am simply adding one function to the other. So I could go in and plug in for my f. I could go in and plug in f of x, negative x cubed plus 4. And I can plug in my g of x, 2x minus 4. And then I do whatever I can to drop the parentheses. But it's seeing as everything is positive right here, all I, I mean, I really can just go ahead and drop that parentheses. And I can go ahead and see that I've got something that can simplify away, and I'm left with negative x cubed plus 2x, or if I factor out that x, I'm left with x times negative x squared plus 2. And that's our simple function operation. That should be, that should feel review, like review. That should feel simple. Henry buys a plant when it's 18 inches tall. It then grows to 3 inches per year. What function can be used to find the number of years Henry had the plant given the height of the plant? Well, okay, so... 
This is literally asking you to look at a word problem and pull out the equation. That's what it says. That's what it means when it says what function can be used. It's saying, what's my equation, basically? So the important information here is that its original height is 18 inches and it grows three inches per year. That's literally all I need. And if you were struggling with this question, my hint to you is, how would you have solved this? If you made up some fake number of years, how would you have solved it? So I said for seven years. Well, what do we do for seven years? Well, in order to figure out how many inches it grew in those seven years, I'm going to do three times seven, aren't I? Isn't that kind of the normal procedure for figuring this out? If you were like, how many, how many inches would it have been? Well, that's 21 inches, but that's not our end, right? It's not our end. So we got to, we have to add in those original 18 inches. And I can look at this and say, well, hey, there's an equation right here. The parts that were going to stay the same are going to be 3 and 18. And the part that's going to change is this right here. And if it's going to change, that's probably my variable. So I could really see that as 3x. And then what did I do over here? I added 18. So my actual function is probably going to look like 18 plus 3x. But my big hint to you is, is this the only way that I can see this function? Or is there something we've done today or in unit one that tells you there's one other way I can see my function? Okay, so here, this information means composition. That's what this little dot means right here. Composition, it means I'm placing G inside of F. The other way we could see that is F composition G. This helps us, this helps some of us get a visual representation because you know that whatever is in the parentheses is literally going to go wherever a variable is. Just like if I said F of 2, you would take that 2 and plug it into any variable. Anything that's not a variable, you just track down. So here's my first variable, and instead of that, I'm going to put in G of X squared plus 1. Those aren't variables, so I track those through. Well, we don't distribute exponents. However, this is a property of exponents that says 2 squared and x squared is the same as this, plus 1. If I simplify that down, that becomes 4x squared plus 1. So this is f composition g of x. Okay. Our next question simply reverses the composition. What about, oh, I got a little ahead of myself. My apologies. Our next question is asking for the inverse. And what is an inverse? We talked about this already. The formal definition simply tells me that we have a symmetry over the y equals x line. I have to have that symmetry. And the other thing I can do when I do find an inverse to actually solve for the inverse, I take my x and my y and I reverse them. So this is currently saying y equals 2x plus 9. Well, I'm going to flip those variables and now I solve for y. So I'm going to subtract away the 9. That becomes x minus 9 equals 2y. I divide, I divide the 2 because I'm trying to get y by itself. So that tells me y equals x minus 9 over 2. Well, we know that this isn't y. We know that that's the inverse. So we write it as an inverse. Okay, here we have another real world composition. Very first thing you're supposed to do is find the equation. So Francis orders a pizza, he uses a 20% off coupon. Ooh, that looks important to me. And then he pays $3 for delivery. And then it even gave me what my coupon and delivery function are called. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is declare those. My coupon is 20% off. So that tells me I'm really looking at one minus 0.2 times X, or that's the same as saying 0.8 X. My delivery price is going to be plus 3, whatever the original price is, so x plus 3. So now I have my two uh, compositions, but it's asking me which one is actually the total amount. Is it going to be the coupon and then the delivery or delivery and then the coupon? Well, let's try both. So here is the delivery applied first. Okay, so I do uh, 0 0.8 times x plus 3. And if I track that through, if I distribute, that's 0 0.8x plus uh, whatever 0 0.8x times 3 is. And then, of course, we're going to do decompose C, and we'll join back in that second video in just a second.